Greetings. My name is Louis Molina, and I'm the host of the Life Perot podcast. In today's episode, I talk to Jeff Striva, who is a native of Morgan City. He owns his own graphic design company and is an avid duck hunter and clay target shooter. As a side note, due to technical issues, the first 15 minutes will just feature my camera angle, so we apologize for the inconvenience. Anyway, feel free to light up a cigar and enjoy today's conversation. Yeah, man. Um, so it's a funny story. You asked me about my my commute, my uh, right. laborious tr- commute of seven minutes. Right, right. Um, so when I first moved here in a town with my brother to open up this location in Baton Rouge, we actually lived across the street, the house Dude. across the street. Yeah, so it's kind of weird because I remember looking at this building at night. I would smoke my cigar on the porch, and I'd, I'd always look at this building. And think, oh man, I would love, yeah, to have a shop there. Right. And our shop was, you know, about mm, three hundred yards away. But this building was just perfect. It was standalone, its own parking lot. It had everything nice. that that we wanted to yeah. to deal with. So, but yeah, thanks for coming in today. Um, so what we'd like to do first sure. is offer you a cigar. So I love that. Would you like a cigar? Yes, yes, I would. All right. So yeah, we're gonna um, feature the. One of our blends, I know that you're familiar with it. Correct. The Molino de Viento. So, yeah, help yourself. Let's just uh, let's get to the cigar ritual first. The, wind, we the windmill. Jump into. Correct. Yep, that's it. Uh-huh. Yep. Molino de Viento means windmill in Spanish. Okay. So, yeah, nice. help yourself. We got the okay. cutter. Good deal. If you want the torch lighter or the matches, it's whatever you want to do. Okay. But, yeah, to give you a little insight into this brand, for m- mostly our listeners, because I know you're familiar with the blend. Yes, sir. Molino de Viento is essentially a tribute to the windmill, the okay. Spanish windmill. So when you go to Spain in the uh, Castilla-La Mancha region, if you know, if you're familiar with the works of Don Quixote, yeah, you know, right. the, the the windmills, That's th- those are actually historical landmarks in Spain. Okay. They actually have these old, I guess, ancient windmills that are designated landmarks. So we kind of wanted to pay tribute to that and just the, the whole region of Spain. And we went with Justo and Julio Aroa. Okay. To make this in Honduras. Ah. So that's an old Cuban family. They've been in Honduras really since the, the Cuban embargo, or not the embargo, the uh, the, the mass migration uh, before the revolution. Okay. And uh, yeah, they're helping us out with this blend, and it's really good. Uh, mild profile, uh, creamy. We wanted more of like a blend that the, you know anyone could enjoy, whether they're beginners or experts. So I think they did a good job. And I like this a lot because we talked about, which we'll get into, uh, yeah. duck hunting together. And I was like, oh, Luis, man, I don't know if I can do a cigar that yeah. early in the morning. But you you hit you hit us with these, and these were fantastic. Just what you said, light and creamy. Yeah, and that's what we wanted was just a cigar that was approachable by anyone, whether they're a beginner or expert. And the Aroa family, they're, they're known for producing a lot of great leaf. They have their own factories. They're really vertically integrated. So we were stoked that... Uh, Justo and Julio helped us out with this, you know, this, this exclusive blend. Now this was you, your dad, and your brother. All, correct. All, correct. Yep. Okay. Yep. And then we hooked up with the Aroas and uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. So we we sell it in store or online, and uh, we think it's a it's a nice tasty blend. It's a big group, right? The twenty five. Yeah. 20, so it's, we, So yeah, we put them in bundles just to reduce the cost of packaging. So sure. you know the consumer is not paying for expensive boxes but it's it's really quality so i mean to me I, we could even sell it at 15 bucks but it's around se- seven or eight bucks okay yeah you know, stick but handmade log filler yeah the, right. all, the works yeah i love that i've gotten several bundles yeah since, yeah i know you're a fan so, me, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like you said it's a good early morning cigar That's so but um yeah let's get into it thank you again for coming in today happy to be here yeah. man happy the, to the, be the ride was good huh it was yeah. no, no worries i left a little early to be safe and uh, no yeah. worries man no worries so where do you live Morgan City, Louisiana, okay. obviously, about an hour south of Baton Rouge, and an hour from New Orleans, and an hour from Lafayette. So, kind of just directly south of Baton Rouge, pretty much. And is that where you grew up? That is. I grew yeah. up there, uh, moved away a little bit for college, and then two summers of college, I lived in Florida. But for the most part, there. Uh, I did live here in Gonzales for a few years. My wife went to LSU Law School. And graduated from there. So for three years we were in Gonzales. Oh, okay. I didn't know but, that. Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, and then we and and then we moved back to uh, uh, Morgan City. Yeah. Yeah. So for people, especially outside Louisiana, what what can you tell me about Morgan City? What what's that about? Is it? So I, you gave me the directions, but like in terms of the culture, 
Can you give me instances of growing up, what, what it was like living there? Absolutely. So it was, it's in the what's known as the Cajun Coast, uh, all Cajun boats everywhere, uh, trailers, boat launches, water everywhere. Um, a, a prime example of, of my little area, I would, in high school, of course, being able to drive, I would take my boat to school, not in the boat, on the trailer, but then we'd go straight from school, straight to the water and kneeboard, hydroslide, water ski, all that kind of stuff. So oh, it was man. real big. And then, of course, on the weekend, lots of fishing and uh, and then duck hunting. Uh, lots of others do deer hunting, squirrel, rabbit, all that type of thing. I'm a big duck hunter. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it was a uh, bayou life, quiet, small enough. It was beautiful because it was the scenery, of course, but then you could go to you know, Baton Rouge, Lafayette, or New Orleans if you wanted to hit the big city or the mall or to go shopping or et cetera. So it was uh, really laid back. So Morgan City is – is it like Acadia, Acadian area, or is it like is it more like Lafayette culture, uh, or is it just it's got its unique? It's it's, it's unique. Uh, the Cajun Coast is like St. Mary Parish, Louisiana's parishes, parishes of course, mm-hmm. and it was it's more it's some Acadian, some Cajun, some some New Orleans influence, um, some Metropolitan Baton Rouge influence, so a little bit of everything. It's not strictly Lafayette Acadians. Uh, area stuff. Yeah, yeah. So it's like a hybrid. It's like yeah, a hybrid. It, is. Of, it really is. A, a little melting yeah, pot. Yeah. A melting pot within the melting pot of yeah. South Louisiana. So, um, and then of course, believe it or not, you can go farther south, and it's not quite that Cajun. You know, it's uh, there. There's more, less roads, more waterways. This yeah. is, you know, this is that next step up. So that's like in South Terrebonne. Correct. Yes, Parish. that's yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, have, roads cut have, off. Yeah. All that kind of area. Sure. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what? So you started hunting and and really getting acclimated to the outdoor life early on. Early on, my dad, yeah. my dad was a duck hunter, and so that's what I kind of did with him. And then in high school, branched out and tried other hunting and stuff, but uh, duck hunting was it was grabbed me. But uh, so I'm like my brother in law is a big deer hunter, so we we trade. I'll shoot some ducks, he shoots a deer, and we kind of trade off some of the meat. So nothing goes to waste. So yeah, it's that's pretty awesome. cool. But yeah, duck hunting, uh, fishing, the area. My little area of Morgan City, even uh, this lake right there, and then waterways in the in the by the houses. So I was fishing. I mean, I'd go from school, I'd, I'd burn through my homework so I could get out there and fish and spend the rest of the day fishing or hanging out with my buddies, swimming or you know, just just water was a, just a way of life. What what kind of fishing was that? That was freshwater fishing, perch and bass, um, sockele, which is white crappie. Yeah, a lot of people. Yeah, that that, that <laughs> species is that. weird. Like, there's so many names yeah, for it. But, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. that was freshwater. A uh, little, you know, the little cork like you imagine, and you had the red and white cork with you know uh, shrimp or or worms under that, and just get catch as many as you wanted. Man, it was crazy. And is there a redfish where you were? Fish? Redfish. So from Morgan City, right south of it is the Intracoastal, which goes east west, goes all the way from Florida to Texas. So below the Intracoastal, it gets brackish and saltwater. So that's red oh. redfish. So to answer your question, yes, I could get to catch redfish, but all around my house was all freshwater. So it was the best of both worlds. Because if I on the weekends, my buddies and I would get in our boat, load up, and go red fishing, or speckled trout fishing, saltwater, in the brackish area, or just right by the house. If we want to do just catch a couple fish in the morning, you go right behind the house, yeah. catch some fish, catch some freshwater fish. Yeah. So it was both. So it's really just that. Emphasis of Louisiana being a sportsman's paradise. You could you could do it all. Definitely, we really could. Hunting, fishing, swimming, boat riding. I mean, it was it was it yeah. really was outdoors. There's no doubt. Yeah. yeah. And so, what do you do today? What uh, besides the hunting? <laughs> well, I try for, to for, do that for, for nine to five. Uh, what we had mentioned. Well, so my my uh, job. I have um, my own graphic design firm. Um, I hate to call it an agency because it's me, but I have a group of people that I work with that we can all help each other out. They're also graphic designers. So that we're, it's just, I'm one man, but if I get busy, crazy busy, then I can call on these guys to help me or I help them, et cetera. So that works out pretty good. But uh, yeah, graphic yeah. design, logos, websites, brochures, that type thing. Yeah. And I, and I asked Social that media. because you did our logo uh, for okay. our private lounge. Yeah, that's yeah, correct. Yeah. yeah, the Lighthouse Lounge. I love it. That was a yeah. fun, fun project. Yeah. A lot of my clients are oil field stuff, which we'll get into in a oh. second. But stuff like your project was just out there, which was awesome. It's not something I do every day. But it, was all, it, was, it worked out great. We had a great relationship, and it worked out. So, yeah, yeah that was big fun. That was a big logo. Yeah. And, and you, you were pointing it out to me before when I yeah, got yeah. here. I hadn't seen it on the walls yet. That's really yeah. cool to see it you know, in, the, in the space. So. Yeah, I, get, I bet you get like some satisfaction seeing your work 
like actually printed or out in the field. Huh? I do, yeah, yeah, no doubt, yeah, yeah. Getting uh, specialty items printed. This is one I did for my cousin, which yeah. will uh, are then seen like you like you have on the wall yeah. or billboards for my oil food clients and stuff. You know, driving, I'll do a billboard and all of a sudden I'll look up and say, "Oh, hey, I did that." Uh, yeah. So that was so that was pretty cool. You know, seeing you seeing your stuff that you have created on my computer and I, my wife's get tired of it. I was like, look, dear, I did this. Look, there it is. She's like, I know, yeah. I know. You told me 20 times. Yeah. Well, but hey, it's fun. It's, yeah, you should be proud yeah, of, it, of your work. That's awesome. It really is. It's it's not like, you know, if it's a sales call and you give a product to a person, that's one thing. But this is like seeing it and then it, other people see it and it's, you know, represents a business. So that's a really cool thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. We appreciate it. I mean, I loved how it came out. Awesome. And we'll show it on, on screen when, when this gets published great, great, great. for our customers. But um uh, yeah. You know, we want to incorporate elements of our uh, of the Havana Port brand. You know, people know the geography of of, of the port of Havana, Cuba. Right. There's that structure. It looks like a lighthouse. They they call it El Moro. Um, okay. And I think at one point it was like some some tower, like a defense tower. I don't know if it uh-huh. got converted to lighthouse. I don't, I don't actually know the history of it that much. I should look into <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Look it up. But it, I mean, it's it's an iconic structure in, in sure. Havana. So we wanted to kind of feature that for our private lounge concept called that we brand the lighthouse lounge by right. Havana port. So we appreciate that. And then when I, when I got with you on this, I had seen that structure. I didn't know the name of it and any of the history and all, but I had knew that known that structure. That was a good icon for this logo because we, as an outsider looking in and then you as an insider, we both knew it. So that was a great uh, icon to use for the logo. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. All right. So let's get into a topic that I'm very intrigued by okay. about you. All right. What can you tell me about your life as a is it a clay target shooter? Sporting clays. Okay. Sporting can you clays. can you delve into that and maybe explain like start from from the chapter one like what is clay <laughs> versus skeet? Right. Like assume I know nothing about that sport. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what everybody is used to is uh, skeet, which is the orange discs made of clay. You a machine throws them and then you shoot them with a shotgun, a special shotgun shell, low brass. We'll get into all that. But you shoot that, and then they break, and you mark that as an X. Or if you miss, you put an O. So skeet is a little different. It, a skeet range anywhere in the world is the same exact uh, horseshoe shape that you shoot from, and the towers are left and right. So it's the same dimensions, the same. If I go one in Texas, here, uh, Cuba, anywhere. It's the oh, same exact it's layout. It's a standard, yeah. standard layout. Okay. What sporting clays is, a lot of people describe as golf with a shotgun, and that what that mm-hmm. means is you have uh, usually ten stations. You do ten stations of ten shots each, ten five pairs, but every station is different, and every course has a different layout. So one's a sh- some one station at one course is a short shot. The next might be a long with a high bird, and then the next one might be the next course. You know, right down the street might have all trees. Whereas another one might be all oh. open or some combo, so it it's like golf courses. They're, the same yeah. general principle, yeah. but they look very, very different. So that's the difference between sporting clays and skeet. It's non-uniform, so you get new looks everywhere you go. It, so for shooting. So when did you start this sport? So I picked it up. My cousin, uh, big influence for me. Big call each other brother in the in each other's wedding the whole night. Yeah. Uh, he moved to Houston to start uh, his oil field uh, career. And that was a big thing. It was taking over golf was uh, sporting clays tournaments. So salesmen would call and take you sporting clays shooting instead of uh, uh, golfing. So he got big into that. So I learned about it through from him. Okay. But then, uh, and then I'm, he and I are just super competitive in a great way. But yeah. so he's like, man, you got to try this. You got to do this. So at about that time, Louisiana, uh, Morgan City, my area, home my area, uh, had one or two courses, very small compared to the eight or ten top end in Houston where he was shooting. So I would I would drive to him on some, on a few weekends and man we would just shoot like crazy. All we could shoot to our arms were black, our shoulders were black and blue, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just shooting as much as we could. Yeah. And then he was getting uh, he got really involved because oil field companies would want to uh, network like like salesmen do on oh. golf course. So he was getting to do a lot of shoots, and then they would have charity shoots as well. Um, a company like Devon or Anadarko Oilfo Company would put a tournament on and donate the proceeds to the American Heart Association or the local, you know, 
kids church group would put on a uh, an event to raise money type thing. Yeah. So those are more charity shoots. Those are a little softer. And what I mean by softer is the targets are a little easier. They want everybody to oh, go yeah. home happy. <laughs> yeah. They oh man, I cracked them today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was a charity shoot or register? Oh, yeah. it was a charity shoot, but yeah. it's still funny. Yeah. Games. So anyway, so back to it. So the sporting clays, you shoot a round of a hundred. Okay. You can sh- you can shoot fifty if you have you know less time, but a tournament or a standard round is a hundred. Round of 100, 100 shells. 10 stations, usually 10 shots, like we said. Um, and then you score, you score, you, you just get your score out of 100. X's are O's. And then, of course, you rib each other like you and I would go. You say, yeah. oh, I hit that one. No, you didn't hit that one. Yes, yeah. I did. Yes, I did. Yeah. Okay, and you put the X. It's all fun and games. But then you can get competitive, too. So um, you, you shoot shotguns, 12-gauge. Okay. Um, they do have sub-gauges where you can shoot 20-gauge or 410 or 28. That gets really hard. Because it's less BBs, less pellets. You got to really be focused to hit that. What they call that spread, right? With when, that spread. For people who right, don't know, the choke, maybe the spread. Sh- yeah, right. shotgun. Yeah. Right. The shotgun uh, has uh, the shotgun shell has BBs in it, and the the choke modifies the amount of the spread, the, the wideness of yeah. the pattern or the tightness of the pattern. So for a longer shot, you want a tight pattern oh. so it don't have enough uh, um, force to get there. Or a wide, a closer shot, you want it wide open so you can even be kind of a little bit off and hit it. Yeah. So. So it's, like I said, so they do that. So I got into it with him, and then it started picking up speed uh, here in Louisiana, and then I just got really, really into it. So um, one of my clients in Houston uh, who I got from Sporting Clays, um, I wasn't officially sponsored. I don't want to put that out there, but okay. I, I was their kind of backup guy, their kind of go-to team B, you know, if somebody couldn't make it. Because I wasn't in Houston. I was here. So if somebody canceled out, hey, can you, hey Jeff, can you make it? Yeah, yes, heck yes, I can get there. I'll be there in four hours as soon as I can get there. So I'd shoot on those teams. Again, not sponsored, but, you know, I had some product from them and, you know, all their gear and that type thing. So oh, okay. we got to shoot a bunch of registered shoots and then some uh, charity shoots as well. But uh, they actually make the chokes that go at the end of the gun. And the choke, like we said, is what spreads the pattern tight or loose depending on the shot you have. Okay. So they manufacture chokes, but then they have, a, you know, all new guns they sell and then some used guns and then clothing and that type of thing. And then a gunsmithing area, too. So, Okay. So, yeah, that's what I wanted to verify. How far did you take this sport? I, I didn't know if you were a professional or semi or amateur or um, a little bit. But they kind of guess, it's, it's a little different. Yeah, it's, not yeah, like, yeah. it's not as mainstream as, you know, golf or basketball or something like that. So there's... But there there's, are professionals or there, people... There who, are professionals for a very short... Time there was the sporting clay professional sporting clays association, um, and I didn't shoot in that, but I worked with the, some of the guys who put that on. And for two years, it was on NBC Sports and then the Outdoor Channel, and oh. then it just kind of went away. But um, we we would get to shoot the tournaments before and after to kind of test it and that type of thing for the for the make sure every shot was you know at least hittable and that type of thing. Oh, and okay. then they would did that. So uh, I'm not officially professional, but uh, I would uh, I'd say semi. That's, yeah. yeah. Do you still get out there? And, and I do. Not as much as I, I, I used to, um, but, yeah, definitely still yeah. shoot. My dad and I are big buddies, and so he'll come to town and we'll go eat some wings and uh, go shoot and then after smoke a cigar and, you know, hang out yeah. uh, once a month or, or so. So, so, so that sport is definitely more like uh, cigar friendly, oh, kind of like golf. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Because you, you're, well, you're shooting, yeah, you're, you're outdoors, of course, and then um, <clears throat> you'll be shooting and I could – you know, puff away and then put it down, and I could shoot. And when I'm shoot my ten shots, I can still pick it up, still lit, all yeah. good. And it's, it's camaraderie and, and and friendly. So yeah, no doubt. Yeah, Definitely. that's that's so Super cool. Yeah. yeah, that's what's intriguing me about that sport is that it, it seemed like it lent itself to, you know, pairing with a cigar. Yeah, and you're in the you're in the golf cart, uh, and you go into the different and like I said, it's outdoor, and you, you go around the course and just take your time. You go at your own speed, so it's it's fun. Yeah, it really is. Definitely you, cigar friendly. So I'm sorry. Do you see that world? increasing like in terms of interest are there more people getting into it is it kind of stagnant no you know definitely it's definitely on the on the upswing because um they're even come out with like so we talked about skeet and sporting clays but now they have um they have several offshoots of it even um uh, i'm gonna draw a blank right here because we're talking yeah yeah. but there's several other um, like a hybrid or hybrids something? hybrids uh super sport okay um and stuff like that so yeah it's definitely on the increase um you can do it year round. Um, there's lots and lots of access. It's kind of like golf. You know, you you can you can find the course 
pretty much anywhere. I think Baton Rouge probably has like three courses that I know of, you know, on the outskirts. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah, I don't even uh, know that. I never yeah, looked into that. Port okay. Island and then uh, just west of here. Uh, it's two courses I know. I can't think of the name of that one, of course. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely, yeah, it's accessible. It is on the upswing too. And then a lot of women and uh, girls and women are kind of getting into it. I say a lot. A, a but there's more, amount, more, yeah. more participation. Yeah. yeah, because the uh, the sporting uh, clays are, are catering to it, and the gun manufacturers are even catering to it, producing a little bit lighter shotgun so oh. they can handle it and swing it more. Um, <clears throat> you shooting, <clears throat> excuse me, Yeah. low brass shells, which are less kick less you, you, okay let's say duck so like, like lead, lead like less lead less gunpowder it's oh. just a lighter load in terms of the kick is oh, the main thing okay. that, so yeah. you know you could shoot you could shoot 100 shells pretty easy you know it doesn't you're not banging okay. your shoulder it's not like the big duck load three three and a half inch trying to yeah. hit them you know a zillion miles away and you gotta you know hit them Sporting clay is a, one BB hits the sporting clay and it breaks and you get your X. What? Just one BB is it, all it takes. One BB could break. I mean, it got to be a perfect BB, yeah. but yes, one just one will hit it, and, and it especially if it's so there's broad face where if it so this is a side view of the sporting clay. Okay. And then sometimes they'll throw them where you see the whole belly or the whole oh. top, and if the whole belly that's the thin thin middle, and if one BB just hits that, it'll crack in half, and that's all it takes. Or you hit the edge of it and you chip it. Oh. If it's on the edge, you're trying to shoot through all that clay. It's a little bit harder shot because yeah. it's trying to go through that clay. Yeah. But anyway, so back to where we started with the ladies, the, you know, the the light loads, you know, you can do it. My wife comes, she sh- shoots 50, mm-hmm. um, and then she'll watch or pull pull for me. That's another part of it. So you you when you get into the station, you 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 only load in the in the box in the in the station. Okay. And you can. You can see a pair. So the other person, your partner, will shoot the, will hold the, uh, the little remote control and press the pair, and you get to see the shot you're about to take. And so then you close your gun, and you get ready to line up, and then you call pull, and the, your part, the person with you or your partner presses the button, and you, it shoots the shot, the skeet, the sporting clays, and then you shoot them. So uh-huh. she'll come and shoot 50, and then she'll just hang out and pull pull for me for the other 50. Yeah. So. How is she? Is she, is she any she's good? pretty good, yeah, yeah. Believe it or not, she she gets down on herself. She's competitive like me, and she gets down on herself, but she does fine. Yeah, yeah, she, that's cool. She does well. that, that seems like a cool like a uh, uh, event or activity for couples. It really you know? is. It really is because, like you said, we can, you can shoot as many as you want. You twenty five, fifty. She can you know shoot mm-hmm. fifty and be good. Uh, my son comes. My dad comes, like we mentioned. So you can you know your friends, of course, obviously shoot with your friends. Yeah. So. Any any scenario you kind of want, you can you can shoot and, and and have fun with. So, yeah, it's it's friendly. Yeah, yeah. So family friendly. I guess, and this kind of segs into the next discussion. Okay. How has this uh, clay target shooting transferred to like your duck hunting skills? Obviously, it, the, it helps, right? It helps. So it's not one to one though. It, it helps in that. Well, here's why. So it helps mm. because the more you shoot, the more your hand eye coordination stays in in contact. Right. You can okay. you can see that. What ducks do, as you know, is they come, they pick when they're coming and where they're coming and when. Sporting clays, you can set up, you can take a deep breath, you know the shot that's about to yeah, happen. Yeah, you know the arc or the path. You right. know the pathway, yeah, yeah. and then you can say pull oh. when you're ready. So you and I be smoking a cigar in the duck blind, yeah. all of a sudden two, two T will go by, and, and we can't even get our guns yeah. up because they already passed. Yeah. Right? So it's a little bit different in that they, they determine the action, the ducks do, as opposed to the sporting clays, but it definitely helps. You know, because you're shooting, you know, shooting, just shooting, you yeah. keeping that skill, the skill up. So, yeah. Yeah. A lot of people, I even, I'm guilty of it too. Everybody is. I just assumed, oh man, I am smoking the sporting clays. I'm going to go crush the ducks. And I got out there on that first hunt and I was like, oh man, I missed, I don't know how yeah. many in a row. I was like, oh, this is not one to one. Yeah. This is, this is not direct. Mm. So, so how, so go, yeah, going back to your, I guess, the, the timeline of, of your duck hunting history. And maybe let's for the viewers who don't know this sport. I mean, in okay. Louisiana, sure. it's such a culture of duck hunting. Absolutely. What like what is it about? Are there different types of duck hunting? What do you, what do, what do you like? Can you kind of explore that? Sure, sure. So, um, in South Louisiana, it's it's mostly marsh hunting. It's just that soupy marsh picture you have in your head, just nasty, muddy. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't have to get that dirty, but anyway, it's in that area, and um, that's what I've always grown up doing. Um, even in South Louisiana, there's slightly different vegetation and terrain. The oilfield companies 
cut trails in the past to get to, to create oil rigs or to create places for the oil rigs. So you better go down canals, and then off, off the canals, there's the marsh area where you can hunt if you got the lease. So a lot of times there's treed area if you go if your camp happens to be where these canals were, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago when they were in use. Or like where I'm at now, it's just a main intracoastal waterway, and then there's just the land, and it's just wide open. And there's some scrub brushes and trees, but it's pretty wide open. So there's a little bit different terrain, um, but then there's a bunch of different types of ducks. Um, freshwater ducks even get some – we get a lot of diving ducks, which are – so there's yeah, maybe explore that. Okay, what are yeah, the differences yeah. of so, ducks? Okay, yeah. so, so there's dabblers, which tilt their bodies, and they don't go completely underwater. Their butt and their feet okay. kind of stick out like a mallard, the, the green head, which everybody's used to. That's a dabbler because he, he dips his body in to eat, and he, to go underwater, and, and then goes back. A diver, like a canvasback or a redhead duck, not a woman, a redhead duck, yeah, yeah. Uh, canvasback, they literally dive completely underwater and get the vegetation underwater and are some small fish in vertebrae stuff like that so you got your, your divers and your dabblers but they all kind of in south louisiana they all kind of intermix um so we we get a, a, a mixture of that obviously so, okay um but yeah so you do that you a, a typical weekend would be you pack your cigars and you camouflage clothes um lots of people have camps you 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 have a camp you get a campsite lease and a duck lease the oil field companies have all this land in South Louisiana. And it's all marsh, huh? It's all marsh. And right? they own, and it's, to and me, they, it's a weird concept. Yeah, like they, they have owning that. like marsh or water. Yeah, right. Because yeah. there's not, there's literally nothing there. So you, they, they can go and do exploration to see if there's oil deep underneath it, you know, but they want all that land so they can put the rigs, et cetera, et cetera. But to double their money, they, they get leases, like a group of guys who get together and, and get a lease. And we have that one section, which I think is, I don't know, 640 acres by 640 acres. Don't quote me on that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, it's something we'll sizable. It something it's sizable. sizable. Okay. Yeah, so you could have. That's like a standard parcel, I yeah, guess? Yeah, it's called a, a, a section. Oh, okay. And then they're, they're you know, they, they're literally horizontal along the coast, section one, section two, section three. Hmm. So I might have section two, and you might have section 16, and we're kind of near each other. Um, so we, there, there's that type of thing. But yeah. anyway, so you get your section, you have your camp, you pack your clothes, you gun, you uh, – your, uh, cigars, and then a group of guys kind of meet on like a Friday. You put your, you go put your decoys out. You have your surface drive boat, which we're, I'm sure we're going to do. Yeah, we'll, we'll explore we'll that. Yeah, that. Yeah. Um, put your decoys out. Usually cook a meal that night, smoke a cigar. You get up the next morning. It's right at day break. break. It's from sunrise, half an hour before sunrise, to official sunset. You can shoot. Most people hunt in the morning and then let the ducks kind of rest and recuperate and hang out. So you don't scare them all off your lease. If you hunt all day, every day. They're going to say, man, I'm getting shot there. I'm not going there. That's what they refer to that's, as high pressure. Correct? That's right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly correct. That's right. So you mainly shoot the morning. Occasionally you do an afternoon hunt just for fun. Just, you know, every once in a while. It won't do too much damage um, to your population. But you go in the morning. So you get up. I love this story. My son, uh, I woke him up to go hunting. I'm getting okay. sidetracked, but it's so yeah, funny. Yeah, no, I like it. I yeah. love it. So he... I said, hey, Dad, hey, Jordan, we're gonna go. We're gonna go duck hunting. Oh man, Dad, that's great. So we went, took him with me. So we go to sleep, do our do our thing, go to sleep. Wake him up the next morning. Hey, all right, buddy, get up. It's time to go. Time to go. Luis, he he opens his eyes. He's like, Dad, it's the middle of the night. Oh, he didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> he had, he didn't really put it all together. It was like you know four thirty five four four thirty a.m. So it's still dark outside. It's like I know, man, we got to get ready. Like, the ducks don't sl- they they're ready to move. We got to get out there. It's like, oh no, man, I got to sleep some more. Yeah. We'll get them later in the day. I said, like, buddy, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. <laughs> so he laughed, but I love that. That was the middle of the night. So anyway, he got up and and we we got up there and he loves it and he's hooked like I am. So yeah, that was his first experience. But uh, he was like, no, no way, man, this is way too early. Yeah. But then he discovered uh, girls, you know, late when he's a teenager, obviously. And so he's like. Oh, Dad, I don't know if I can go the whole weekend, buddy. Let's <laughs> yeah. go Friday and come back Saturday or Saturday. Right. I got plans, man. I He's got to have a Saturday night free. I got for my the, Saturday yeah. night free, yeah, buddy. For the social yeah. activity. So yeah. he comes with me on a Friday night or so, whatever. Yeah. That's funny. So, And then I bring him back to the land, and it's close enough. Yeah. But anyway, so, we, so you hunt your Saturday. And, and when's I, the season, typically, at least in Louisiana? In Louisiana, uh, it's usually the. it used to be like the first, the very first weekend in November, religiously. Okay. And then now they kind of changed it a little bit. Um, it's either the first or second weekend, depending on how far in. And then it goes through the end of January. Mm-hmm. So November to January, you, you basically winter months. 
and they have little breaks in there called splits. It used to be oh. two splits. You have the first split and the second split. This past season, they changed it to uh, you got three sections, two splits. You have two breaks in there. Okay. The so they call the, yeah, they call the break a split. A break, yeah, yeah. a split. And it's it's to help yeah. the ducks, but it's also to help the wives, too. It's like, hey, yeah, yeah, you're, going, yeah. you're going six, eight weeks in a row, eight weekends in a row. That's yeah. enough. So let's take a break. So you, yeah, because people so are religious. There is, yeah, especially, when, yeah. yeah, yeah, big time. You really get into it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so definitely. So it helps the ducks and, and the and the wives. Yeah, yeah. Girlfriends. Uh-huh. So anyway, so back to where we were. So Saturday you get up, you you make your hunt, you come back, you have a you have a breakfast, um, take a little nap. Some camps you can get the satellite dish, you can watch a little college football because that's the same time frame. Oh yeah. Of course. College football, yeah. Yeah. And then a, a, a different cousin than the one I mentioned earlier, he comes with me. He loves to cook. So he's, you know, ten AM, he's starting to prepare his roux and cutting up all this stuff to make his oh, gumbo man. or his yes. stew or whatever. And then uh and then you just kinda cut up and hang out for the rest of the afternoon, smoke another cigar. Yeah. Um, Sunday you get up, you do the hunt again. And then you come back and you clean the ducks and kind of get going because you want your rest of your Sunday to get back and kind of get set back for your Monday work schedule. Yeah. So, but uh, and work you, the you, week and then repeat. And, 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 yeah. work, and repeat, right. Yeah. So you got your good full weekend and then you get your work in during the week. So. Yeah. And that's pretty yeah. standard. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah yeah. 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 Lots and lots of the boat, the boat launches uh, on those weekends. You like, it, it's like jam packed. Yeah, it's it packed, goes from yeah. empty to jam packed. And I'm sure there have been instances of like, Hot tempers, impatient people. Like, that's one reason why I don't, I really, I've never tried public land hunting. Right. Because I'm sure you have people like, they get aggressive, trying to get their spot and that issue. So, yeah, I try to, you know, just do the private lease where I can, you know. I'm I'm kind of afraid I've never tried the public hunting, you know. Yeah. Yeah. The public hunting is, like you just said, it's very weird because you can, you can build a duck blind, but you can't use, like treated two by fours, you only natural stuff because they don't want they don't want somebody to build some permanent blind and then you know in the dark affect somebody the, uh, hit it and yeah. affect the affect the uh, environment, but also they don't want you somebody to hit it because oh. the public lands usually a little bit farther out. You just what you said, everybody's racing to get to the yeah. blinds, so you can build them on like a, a willow trees, thin thin willow trees, and you can make a blind. You can tie it with string. You can't use nails or two by fours. But the point of that is, you on the public land. You can't claim your blind, even though you built it. If you build a blind on public land and I get out before you and hunt it, oh wow, I hunt it. So it gets real. It gets kind of yeah, kind of sketchy yeah. out there. Now, Oof. you know, then people with guns. And then the guys are just about to say, and people like, got Oof. guns and how mad if somebody had you know some drinks that night that night or right. before, and because it's you know four in the morning, they might have gone to the bar at two and and maybe not I, even sleep. And not even sleep. Yeah. Go, it, several people I know used to do that. Oh, <laughs> I didn't yeah, do yeah. that, but they would go to the bar. Go to the bar with their boat and truck wow. in the parking lot and leave and then go to the duck camp, not to the camp, to, to the public area and wait for day daybreak and then shoot. Yeah. So, yeah. So oh, public man. is very, very different from, from the private land. Yeah. The, a, a private leash, like we were talking about with the group of guys, you can have, you know, four, six, four, five, six different blinds. So you can have that many people or you can have less people and have the option to shoot different blinds. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's very different. Yeah, and I, and I want to talk about the your spot, the, okay. the duck camp, and I won't divulge, you know, yep, for security right. reasons where it's at. <laughs> That's right. I'll just mention That's Terrebonne right. Parish. But okay. Man, I got to thank you and your group for inviting me the past two years. Yeah, it's that awesome. was awesome. We we yeah. loved having you. That was very cool. Yeah. And I was glad. Uh, and you saved my season this past year. Uh, did I yeah, really? Yeah, okay. Because yeah, yeah. where I where I have my spot, it's it's more south. Okay. And so it's salt here, and this is a weird year right. for, for at least in my spot. The droughts and I yeah, got stuck. Some low water. You I got stuck on my first day. Yeah, right. So and I just and I had to wait for my boat to get fixed because it burnt out. I think the the, the forward uh, clutch or something like that. Right. And I just wasn't getting out there. And then you came and saved the and day saved for me. The, yeah, happy to yeah, do yeah, it, man. Happy to do it. Yeah. What's awesome is so describe describe this, the situation if you can without like revealing the the spot. I guess so like the the duck camp and how how you guys' lease is set up. So we have. Um, the guy, several of his friends got together. I, we got together, and one guy's father-in-law had the camp. Okay. And so he has the lease. He had the lease, and then he had his buddies, and we went as kids. And so now he's passed the torch. He comes on the opening weekend, oh, and cool. then the opening weekend of the second and third splits. He comes like three times or two times. He comes, makes his hunt, and leaves. Yeah. But he leaves it all up to us to do the work and to build the blinds and keep the camp up, et cetera, et cetera. But the beauty is... We all have sons 
that are now. Oh, that's awesome. about to turn, It's a very generational pass, pass the cultural torch thing, to them. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. It's cool to keep that next. So they're get starting to go. Hey, here's the list. So one of my buddies and I would go out before the season and make the list, and then we get to hand it to our sons and his sons and his son's friends. Okay, here's the list. And season opens next month. Let's get all this done. Like, you know, cutting the trail, the the, the trail to the to the blinds. Oh, you got to do prep build, work. You got to do prep work. Build yeah. the blinds, brush the blinds where you cut the, the brush and put it around the mm-hmm. blind. Um, kind of clean up the camp type thing because it's been sitting, for the most part, you sometimes go in the summer if you, you know, to go fishing or whatever, but not a whole lot. And so you get the camp back already, that type of thing. So we have a camp. We have the lease. Uh... On the lease, the camp is right at the adjacent to the lease, right? We start our camp is parked. It's right like at on the, the lease. edge of the it's lease. It's right yeah. on the edge of the lease. That's correct. And describe the, the camp too, and don't forget about that. Okay. It's, to me, it's cool. It's like it, it's, it was so bizarre the first time I went. Oh yeah, right. So it's um, a lot of these. You can have different levels, but a lot of them are like kind of houses you get to by boat. Basically, we have a, a you know, kitchen sink, we have microwave, we have a, a shower. Uh, rainwater. We collect the rainwater. Okay. Uh, for the shower. Okay. Um, we boil water and then rinse the rinse everything for the uh, you know the pots and pans and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But you got a living room, a couch. We got direct TV to watch some college football during the day or fall asleep on the couch, take a little nap. Yeah. But then uh, to the and then on one side we have a, a big table. We have our meals there, kind of outside too. But we like to sit around the table and recap the day oh jeff you missed that yeah, yeah. i can't believe you missed on that. everyone yeah, yeah right. uh-huh. Luis, how did you hit that oh, i can't believe mm-hmm. you hit that that was so sky high etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah so you relive it and then you get that camaraderie together and then we have the back section which is um some bunks we have bunk rooms so every member kind of has the bottom bunk and then the guest can have the top bunk but except for me i'm a big guy <laughs> i'm afraid so i'd like collapse correct. it yeah. so i had to had to do a little planning you can know, yeah, yeah. no it's all good I'm joking, and then uh, and then we have you know bathroom in the back and and then the shower and all that. So it's it's self sufficient. We have a, um, a generator like people have with the houses for the hurricanes. You bring a generator yeah. and bring the gas, and you can run it you know as much or as little as you want for the lights and all that. Um, so yeah, it's it's that we have a we have a little we have a little deck area where we uh, have a little fire pit and a separate little barge that used to be the generator barge, but now with technology, everybody's you know the generators are smaller. You know, just like you're thinking of a, at the house. So that generator shed became the decoy shed, and we store the barbecue pit in there and uh, some fishing gear and that type of thing. Yeah, it's really so, quite the setup. I mean, it, 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 this, you have this floating structure in the bayou. Correct. It's very self-sufficient. It's very comfortable. Yeah, yeah. And it just it's just so easy. Like, you, you, like what time we wake up? Typically like 5.30, 5.45? Yeah, 5.15, 5.30. That's, that's pretty late for a duck hunter. That's correct. Right, but that's because correct. you're right there. Yeah, we were so close. You get more sleep. Yeah, you get you get up right there. Uh, the the early the early crowd is the coffee drinker, so they get up at five and yeah. have the coffee ready to go, and they get up. Then the rest of the gang gets woken up about five fifteen, five twenty, and then by five thirty, five forty, you're in your surface drive, either the gator tail or the pro drive, which we'll talk about, and then you go to the blind. I mean, you and you're there. It, it, the, the the hunting changes by like a minute or two. The the time that you can start, as you know. Based on the clock, right? So, so six. The yeah, as the days, days pass, uh, the days are getting shorter. Yeah, typically, that's correct. And yeah. you have so in it's one winter? minute. Usually changes by like a one minute or two minutes. Okay. And then by the next week, when you that's five days have passed, so it's five minutes later. So you get as the season goes on, you get to sleep a couple of minutes later, oh, a couple see. of minutes later, a except past later. the winter solstice. <laughs> that's then, correct. Then, then, there you then, go. Then, 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 then yeah, then reverse. Yeah, back. yeah, right, yeah. right. But yeah, since it was, since since that the camp is on a barge, uh, right there at the at the lease. The, the ditch is what you get to to go to the you know mm-hmm. between the between the camp and the actual lease itself. It's a little little tiny canal, a little slough where you go through, and then you follow your poles or your GPS or your uh, on your phone and and you, and you know where your blind is anyway. But in the dark, it's a little different than yeah. going to it during the day. And then everybody, so it's it's it goes from zero to sixty, right? So everybody's sleeping. Then one group gets up, the next group gets up. Everybody gets dressed, and then in a mass. You know, six or yeah, eight it's boats. Like, yeah, this just whole all leave this little trail, yeah. flotilla train. And so the front boat has its big light, and we all have our lights on our boat. And and yeah. so you just get in this big line, and all of a sudden this guy will peel off, and you see this guy turn this yeah. way, and this it's guy awesome. turns right, yeah. and then you're breaking out, and you can you can see each other's, you can see the light. It's like I said, remember yeah. it's not much brush in marsh, so you can you can see like I, mm-hmm. our they can see our light, interior lights in the blind while you're getting ready, and then then all the lights go off. 
And then you hear people being goofy and making a chicken call on the duck call or something <laughs> just to be silly. And the next thing you know, you know, it's starting to get light, starting to get light. And then you hear off the shots races, and it's yeah. off to the races. Yeah. And so kind of describe to the viewer, I mean, the, the population is incredible there. Like we've Louisiana has had some issues, right? The last few Correct. decades with the, the duck populations decreasing. Correct. But something about your spot, I don't know what it is. I don't know if you have insight into that. I don't know if it's the vegetation. It just holds these ducks, it, and I, I'm amazed. Like every time I go there, how it's like just armies, like just yeah, it's, of ducks. Yeah, where so, every, while while everywhere else in Louisiana, like they've they've had issues, like right. especially southeast Louisiana. Correct. So the Louisiana, if you would imagine the map, the United States map, straight down north to south in Louisiana is the Mississippi Flyway. There's four flyways of ducks that come from Canada. And that's basically down. The, the duck route. The I duck, guess. the yeah. duck route, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's right. That's the right. Flyway. So we're in the Mississippi Flyway, and so. When I was, a kid, I hate to sound like an old guy, but boy, when I was a kid back <laughs> yeah, in the day, yeah. right. <laughs> oh man, it was so, so, so plentiful. Um, and then the new hot spot kind of became Arkansas, which is a little more north, okay. right? And now it's funny because we went. And why is that? Why, why did it do, like, I'm, I'm sure there are theories. And... The, the theories are um, Ducks Unlimited, which did do a lot of good for, for the mm -hmm. duck population, buying habitat in Canada and that type of thing, built more made more and more ponds and areas and natural life. It was almost being too good at your job, right? They they put these areas in Arkansas and Oklahoma and north that are duck habitats that they don't get formed. And so the ducks were like, well, man, if I could have all the feed I want in Arkansas, yeah. why well, fly to Louisiana and I can stop right here? Yeah. And so there's, I don't know, any any number of theories. Less ducks, who knows. But Global, that's global oh, warming, yeah, maybe. Maybe. The winters aren't as severe. Correct. That's another thing. The winters aren't as severe, and then the few times that there are uh, hard, hard freezes, places in Arkansas and Oklahoma, et cetera, heat the ponds and keep the ponds open. What? So everybody thinks... They heat the ponds. They heat the ponds. So they hmm. literally heat the ponds so that it's water and yeah. not ice. Oh, it doesn't freeze and over. And it doesn't freeze over. Everybody okay. thinks... Ducks can find the food. They 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 want to they want to be able to land and and so if there's water they can land they can and land, then get to yeah. the food. Okay. So if it freezes over they can't get to the food they can't land. I mean they can land. But so you they know can, what I mean. they got to keep going. They got to keep going south. Okay. So now it's called short stopping. So the, the ducks have short stopped in Arkansas. Oh. And here's what's funny, Louise. Louisianans used to complain about Arkansans. Arkansans are now complaining about Oklahoma. We yeah, went to yeah. Arkansas and they're like, man, everybody's short stopping. Oklahoma has all the ducks. Yeah. I was like, well, welcome to our world. Y'all were, yeah. were getting them and Oklahoma's now getting them. So we have people in Louisiana going to Oklahoma. To yeah, I've, ducks, I've heard that which more, is which is the craziest thing. Like, this yeah. used to be like the duck capital this of the country. This really, really was. So, yeah. It, and I don't want to get anybody the wrong impression. There's ducks, but it's right. just not like the old days. Again, it sounded like that. But you limit out in like five minutes yeah, or yeah. something. Right, stupid, right. Yeah, yeah. You, you, could, you could pick teal. Um, and, and they come, they're usually the first flyers. They're right, right at daybreak. So you could, I mean, you can get your limited teal, like you just said, in five minutes. And, and, but you don't really want to do that because you did all this prep work to go <laughs> yeah. five minutes. You right. can go back to bed. That's no good. So you shoot hey, smoke up. a cigar. Yeah, right, right. Hey, there you go. Yeah, yeah. So you shoot. Oh, damn, didn't yeah. So you, uh, so you go hang out for the bigger ducks, the mallards, the gray ducks, oh. that type of thing, that, that type of thing. So, but what amazes me about y'all's spot. It's just the amount. Now, it's only really um, – oh, if you got to relight it again? Yeah, go no, ahead. No, no, yeah. yeah, yeah. This, this kind of reminds oh. me of the duck camp. Where, yeah, right. uh, oh, don't worry I about that it. mess. Oh, yeah, right. yeah. And we so got to keep relighting. <laughs> We're talking so much, we forget <laughs> we, to puff our cigar. we got to right. relight at least five times. That's it, no doubt. Because, yeah, no our doubt. discussions are, are pretty engaging, and I, I appreciate them. We, we're, I guess we're just both catty, uh, chatty Cathy's, but – We are. We, um, I love that, though. So you got you got to relight it. I've already had to relight mine once. but No, but going back to – the, the duck population, but it's really like one type, right? Right. Is the majority? Right. So everybody gets a mixed bag. And when I say that, the different types and different species of, of, of ducks. I mean, you're not going to get some West Coast duck, obviously, but the ducks that we're used to, the mallards, gray ducks, which are gadwall. Yeah. The, um, and, they, what, that, and they got yeah, that name. Explain like the, different, like the different names in Louisiana versus what the rest <laughs> of the country calls it. Right. Yeah. Right. So mallards, everybody... Is the pick the duck people were picturing their head the green heads? Yeah, they're called green heads, mallards. Um, the the females are Susies, believe it or not. Oh, I didn't uh, know that. Yeah, for the mallards. Okay. Um, Drake's actually I think all ducks. Drake's and Drake Sus is the male. Drake duck. is the male okay. and the Susies. But then uh, a gray duck is officially a gadwall. Uh, oh. A smiley is a some a spoonbill or. Uh, 
Uh, it's a spoon bill, and it's yeah, it's a strange it's, it's, like it, beak. It has a beak that looks like a spoon yeah. on the end. So with those spoonies or spoon bills. I, yeah, I never heard smileys. Uh, you called smileys. It okay, uh, smiling mallards because they're similar in feather pattern to a mallard, kinda. Um, but then, so they're nicknamed smiling mallards. Yeah. Um, there's scalp, which is what we have a lot of, and they're called dogries or dogs. Oh, dogri. Yeah, dogri. Yeah, yeah. So, but yeah. there are a lot of Louisianans that kind of look down on that bird. Yeah, huh? it gets a bad rap. I don't know enough about it, but the air, where we are, we get them and they eat all the plant vegetation. So they taste like any other duck. In a lot of places, supposedly they eat fish or, or the minnows and oh. it gives them a fishy taste. And so they're not very good. Oh, I see. So that's where maybe the controversy is. That is. And then okay. here's the other controversy, Luis. Scalp, their skin attaches to the breast and it's really, really difficult to clean. Yeah. So a lot of people just say, oh, you don't want to eat that. That's junk because they don't want to clean the, those birds. They oh. are hard. And I'm, again, it's generalization, but they're right. really hard to clean. So you, you want to shoot less of those because they're really hard to clean. You, you know, so I'm the duck cleaner. Yeah, so and I was going to say, you're, the, you're cleaner, the skilled so I technician. Mind. I got a yeah. little, I got a little pad, a little surgeon. I can get it done, so it yeah. doesn't bother me. But anyway, the main guy at our lease, the guy who's we we got uh, got to be friends with and and have it with, he's like Jeff. You give this was when we, this was several years ago when I started hunt, hunting at this current camp. Tony was like Jeff, take those home, just those, so it's no other ducks. So you know it's those ducks, and cook them. And, and report back to me next week. So I took those scalp home dogri, and man, they were just they were just like any other duck. They tasted amazing. Oh. So from then on, I, from your spot from because of spot, perhaps the the diet the, the, they the eat. The diet they okay. eat. Right, that's okay. right. So I've always cleaned them, but I was just kind of giving them away to different people hunting with me. But then I was like, oh no, those are just as good. I'm gonna yeah, keep yeah. those too. So oh. and luckily it worked out because that's the majority of the bird we have. So when you had mentioned earlier our little area for whatever reason. The, the vegetation or whatever, but we hold that type of bird. It is crazy the amount of birds we have of that species on our uh, on our lease. Yeah. So we'll get so your your duck limit is six. So f- we'll get a limit of six. That's called getting your limit. You, each person can shoot six. Okay. Um, keep it. Shoot six. Shoot, keep six. Shoot, keep six. Right. Um, so of our six, the past couple of years, um, five of the six have been this dogree. Or another name of it is a bluebill, uh, dogri, and then we'd have one teal or mallard or a gray duck or widgeon or whatever. But this past season, it was probably more like four to two. We'd have two two of the other type of duck. So it was four. a little more diverse. So it was a little more diverse, which okay. was really cool. It's exciting. It's fun to shoot, right? I, I could shoot six out of six ringnecks, dogri. I, I don't mind it's yeah. shooting, shooting. Yeah, yeah. But to have those other birds mixed in there is kind of like a it's little like special, little pride, little yeah, trophy, yeah. right? Hey, I got a, I got a gray duck today. Oh, I got two teal. Oh, yeah. you win. So yeah, yeah. it's funny. So we give, we find anything to raz each other about, <laughs> be competitive about. What were some of the most exotic? I guess. When I say exotic species that you, we don't really see right. in so, the state. So, um, like this past year or previous yeah, years. Yeah, we've gotten uh, hooded margansers, which are oh. have a, a real weird back of the head uh, feather pattern. It's kind of weird. I don't, I don't even know how to explain it. We'll maybe pull up a yeah, picture. Yeah, we'll, we'll pull up a picture. Um, we got that. Uh, we get some canvas backs and redheads, which we mentioned earlier, which are the diving ducks, which are more along the coast, but... Uh, we've gotten a few of those. Um, we got, I don't know the exact name of it. I should have did my homework. There's a, a whistling tree ducks, which I don't know much about. Oh. Um, and those are more like in timber, like forest, that, right? That is correct. Yeah. That's correct. Those, that's a beautiful Yeah, it really species. is very pretty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so we got, we got one of those even, I think. That's weird to find in the marsh, right? That is correct. Yeah. Very odd. Really, okay. really odd. So, yeah, that that's... That's what I'd go with for my answer on that. And the mallard, everyone wants the mallard. Yeah, everybody wants the mallard. We've gotten we got some mallards this year. We okay. got some we got some widgeon, which is my favorite American widgeon. Um, like I said, the gray ducks, teal. Teal's uh, good eating. Teal's really it's like good eating. It's a smaller little duck boy. They're, yeah, yeah. They're they 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 wiggle and waggle and zoom and zip and as opposed to a, the other duck, kind of more of a, a standard flight pattern, kind of a straight line. The teal kind of are lower and dodge and dip, and you got to really be focused to hit those guys. That's what amazed me the first time I went with you, because I'm still new. I'm a rookie. Right? At sure, it. Yeah. You were able to tell what species just from like their flight pattern, like. There's no way. It's, and I'm like, I'm just, I'm in shock. It's funny because my cousin, who I mentioned in the very beginning of the podcast, 
he one day he came up to me and said, Jeff, I got to apologize. So I was like, what are you talking about? He goes, um, dude, when we would hunt and you'd say, oh, this is that and this is that, I was like, you're so full of baloney, there's no way. But as he got more and more into duck hunting, he was oh, yeah, you can yeah, identify. Like you, distinct, you really can yeah. distinct them. He goes, mm-hmm. man, I have to apologize. I thought you were full of bull all these yeah. years, and now I apologize. Yeah. So that was funny. But, yeah, you, you just, like anything, you kind of get a little better at it, and you, mm-hmm. you just learn, and you can see what, you know, what pattern, what flight patterns, what shape, the size, like um, the hooded morganza wasn't a great example, but it does have the because we don't see a it's lot. It's a beautiful of, bird, which by we the way. don't see a lot Looking of them. But they have that little that little thing on the head, so you can kind of see that flying if you know, so you can kind of pick it out. The teal, like we said, are very small and fly mm-hmm. low, as opposed to looking up for them. You kind of have to look at eye level for the most part. Okay. And then you can turn this. You can check the, check out the speed of the duck, um, the wing beat, the wing look. Um, a pintail has a long, long, long neck. You can see that. Or the you mean long tail? Or it's got a long neck? Both. A long neck oh, and okay. a long tail. Okay. A pintail. That's a beautiful is, bird, too. I still really haven't seen that. Yeah. brownish chocolate head with a little white stripe on its neck. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so that's a that's a pretty bird. You can see that, you know, easily because it's it's such an odd shape. Um, yeah. So you can pick that out. Um, the canvas back has a, a wedge bill, and so you can see that. Um, and, again, it sounds like baloney, but... Yeah. Back. I'm just looking at the picture. Yeah, yeah it's got a, a red head and white oh, and black yeah. body. That's and awesome. If you look at its bill, it's it's literally wedge shaped instead of a, a curvy, you know, like a pretty mallard beak for lack yeah. of a better word. That's cool. And that's, I guess, a, a concern. Like what I what kind of trips me out is like if someone getting into the sport, like it's hard to do it alone. You really need assistance or people who are experts. Right, right, right. Because you don't want to overshoot. I mean, that's, a, that's a, 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 a violation, type, that's, right? It is a federal, a federal and a state violation. Holy cow. Yeah, yeah. And they don't mess around. They don't mess around. Yeah. That's right. So, yeah. you and, and they can't use that excuse like, oh, I didn't know. Like, I didn't, yeah, well. It doesn't matter. You need to identify that. that. That's correct. Now, yeah, I didn't yeah. know the speed limit on this road. Well, yeah. you got the ticket. You, I didn't know that duck. Well, you're getting the ticket. Yeah. So, yeah, you, you, you usually, you, you're a different, which is fantastic because you're coming with me, but a lot of times it's, it's, Louisiana culture and you just kind of brought up in it and you, you, yeah. you your dad identifies the birds as you you know as when you're younger and then you kind of learn oh, and then you kind of do it or, or from friends and you just kind of learn and help each other out um so yeah you kind of you kind of learn it it just kind of happens but yes if you're a new newcomer from or at least else, if you don't know anyone just pay a guide right that's exactly expert. right yeah. that's right and let them handle all that yeah. you get to you that's just how get, I got into it Okay, yeah. yeah, you just get to go and you shoot and have your fun, and he'll tell you, don't shoot that one or yep, or we can't shoot do- any more of those, et cetera. So, yeah. yeah, that's the way to go. Yeah. Yep, definitely, no doubt. So any, uh, to kind of change the, the topic a little, uh, any exotic hunts that you've taken internationally or around the country? Can so, you explain that? Yes, so I've gotten, I've checked off two of the three things on my bucket list. Okay. So, um, as we know, we talked about uh, dogs. You and I have hunting dogs. Oh, yeah. We didn't even get into the, right, the, the right, retrievers. Right, right, yeah. Right. And, the, so, and the boats, too. We okay. Gotta t- oh, we yeah, got to talk yeah. about that. So, the, the the dog I had before this current dog, the trainer was in uh, Baytown, Texas, and he would go every year to Canada. Okay. He would fly up there. Oh, I'm sorry. I take it back. He would drive up there. And he would literally knock on the farmer's doors. He'd stay for a week, and he'd, knock, he'd, he'd drive. Once he got there, he'd drive all afternoon and see, oh, man, the geese are landing here. You know, they're landing in this field. And he would go knock on the farmer's door, wow. and they'd say, hey, look, I'm, I'm from Louisiana. I want to hunt. Is it possible? And they'd say, absolutely. They'd say, the only thing I want you to do is pick up your, shot, your empty shotgun shells because that mm. gets in the, co- the combine or the harvester, and it messes up their machinery. So they wanted you to pick up your shells, but those yeah. geese eat eat their their crops too. So they they're oh. not opposed to yeah. They want that they, they want uh, that population get, control. Gone huh? right. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, back to your question, I got to go with him one year. Uh, my dad came with me on that trip, and we hunted for a week. And Robert, my guy, he he had mapped out where we were, where we were going to hunt, and so we hunted uh, Canadian geese uh, that whole week in wow. Canada. Um, so another funny little story. We we you get up there and you got to get your license and you get your shotgun shells. You don't want to travel. Is that a hard process? It wasn't as bad as I thought. I oh. I, w- I was really concerned, but it, we went to a Walmart and just like a Walmart here, what? and they had shells and they had the okay. license and everything. But it was funny. They did correct me on this. They said, uh, 
so what, you, you here to, to hunt geese? I said, yeah, we're here to shoot some Canadians. Oh, and no. They, like, <gasps> no, no. They said, if you go in public, say, you came here to shoot Canada's. Yeah. You didn't come here to shoot Canadians. <laughs> yeah, not people. So, not people. Yeah. Right. So uh, so we did that, and we had a, we had a, a <laughs> couple funny. of great hunts. It was really, really cool. So that was one bucket list. So that okay. was in Canada. The other thing, again, I keep mentioning my cousin. I was fortunate enough to go with him. We got to go to Argentina Ooh. and shoot. We shot doves, ducks, and uh Perdi, which is kind of like a pheasant. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, I know so about Perdi, yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, we went for uh, 10 days, I believe. We went to Buenos Aires, and we stayed there a day or two. And then we took another flight to this uh, area, and we, we hunted uh, ducks in the morning, then Perdi midday, and then doves all afternoon. Um, so that was another bucket list item, and that was just, oh, man, that was amazingly off the charts. What was really cool about that is the duck hunting, Completely different ducks, as you would imagine. Yeah, in, like in totally Argentina, different totally different species feather pattern us, yeah. species. They they had teal, but it wasn't our teal. You know, they had hmm. they called it a silver teal. It was small like our teal, but it was t- totally different feather pattern. And then the the medium ducks, the 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 bigger ducks were again same size kind of as ours, but again a whole different species and feather pattern. So that was that was amazing. What kind of hunting was that? Is it more field or rice? That was actually they... oddly enough, it was it was very similar to here. They had some marsh area that were that was off a a, a, a bayou, a canal. I don't even know what they would call it yeah. there. But we went by uh, in little flat boats and outboards, and they had guides for us. And okay. They would take us to the. We'd pull up, you know, kind of on the bank, and then we'd walk over the bank, and there was some trees, and we'd kind of lean against the trees, and they put some decoys out. It was hard bottom, uh, as opposed to the marshes of where in Louisiana. But it was it oh. was very similar in the look in the ter- in the vegetation in the terrain with the exception of those we were standing against the trees but the ducks were you know landing right in front of us they weren't flying through the trees like in Arkansas or something this was you know like that's what they call that timber hunting yeah right exactly in Arkansas was timber hunting we we didn't do the flooded timber this oh was, okay uh, this was this was we were against the trees but the ducks yeah. were in the open area okay. in, in Argentina. So we did that, and man, it was just amazing. It was really fun too because I hunted with a guy who had never duck hunted before, and uh, he, real safe. He had been around guns; he knew guns. You know, he was real safety conscious and all that. Uh-huh. But it was funny because Luis, these birds were coming in so pretty and just fat and just, just. I mean, right there, I was like, God, you could hit that with your eyes closed, pretty much. Yeah. With your eyes closed, pretty much. It was funny. It was but just that easy. It was just that easy because they were just coming right in. And so this guy was like, look, I, I gave him a couple from my sporting clays. I gave him a couple little tips, you know, do this, do that. It wasn't anything earth shattering. Just yeah. He was, just wasn't used to it. Man, and he started hitting them. He thought I was the greatest teacher on the planet. Oh, awesome. It was so great. And then some farther shots kind of came in, and he'd shoot, bang, bang, bang. And then I'd stand up behind him, you know, off yeah. to the side. But then I'd shoot after him, I guess is what I'm trying to say, yeah. and then hit those. He's like, oh, my God, man, look at that. Oh, I can't believe you hit that. Yeah. But it was so fun to see him go from no duck experience to that week he was he was hitting left and right and just hitting them and it was just so great to see him do that growth just in that week wow so that was amazing so we did ducks in the morning come back take a little break and then they had a field with some dogs for the, for the perdi yeah. and we shoot that and, and to get mid-day. to let people know sure, what perdi sure. is i know a little bit about that it's basically partridge okay and the first time i like heard that word was in toledo spain when went one year and they, I went to a little shop. They sold like these little jars. It was basically uh-huh. pate of ah, perdi. Of perdi. And I was like, "What, what? is perdi?" And like, I was asking <laughs> the, the tenant, "Like, what? What is that?" And it's like, "Oh, it's partridge." Okay, so the pate, if people don't know, it's basically emulsified, blended liver. I know a lot of people in this country uh, don't like that, but uh, Europeans love that. Yeah. I love that. And uh, yeah, I had to buy it. They, they had other weird pates, oddly enough, like oh, gosh. pate of, of deer, uh, of venison, I guess. And some other, I think boar. They had a pate uh-huh. of boar. It was kind of strange. So when I you said per D, I was like, Wait, "Whoa!" Oh, they had, I know yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'm not. So gonna how, get what? This. Yeah. What is that like? What is hunting? So that per- was. Uh, I hadn't done much quail or pheasant hunting in my life. Uh, I've seen it and once or twice, but no, to no real success. But we, they had. We were. We were in a line. It was like four of us walk guys. And we had on our orange vests, and we walked in a line together. Oh. And the duck, the duck, the yeah. dog went out. In front of us, and kind of it was searching for him and sniff him and kind of point. Oh, and then it's kind of like quail, kind of like quail, very okay. similar to quail. It was a kind of a stubble field, and you just kind of walk in a line. Okay, and sometimes they took off by themselves. Sometimes the dog would point to him, and then they would take off. And then, of course, w- once it got high enough, you 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 were able to shoot it. 
if yeah. it broke your way or you didn't shoot if it broke the other way type yeah. thing. And that was, um, it was, they were wild. Um, so you couldn't pick, oh, we're going to go have 25 of them. We got, I don't know, six or eight each day. It wasn't anything earth shattering, but we weren't out there for hours and hours either. It was, it was enough excitement. It was really cool. So, mm-hmm. so that was kind of a midday thing. But you, you, again, you hunted in a line, followed the dog, and it pointed it. Oh, pointed that's cool. Them. So, yeah, it was pretty fun, huh? We did that. That was really cool. And then we came back to the lodge again in about from about 2 to, I don't know, almost dark. You'd shoot uh, the doves. And so that was the afternoon of each day. That yeah. was, and that was amazing. Yeah, that sounds like a fun trip. And it I've heard about so Arge- awesome. Argentina as a, a travel destination for hunters. Correct. That is correct. That's yep. a huge thing. Yep. I've talked to the clients in the, sh- the cigar shop over the years. Yeah. And- uh, you, everybody pretty much flies into Buenos Aires, and then from there it's like one hour or two hour flights to like Cordoba or Mendoza. Oh, and that's a that's wine country there too. Do yeah. you have wine? Yeah, it's funny. I'm glad you said that because yeah. I would have forgot that. So they have Argentinian beef oh, and Argentinian yeah, yeah. wine. Oh, my so we gosh. went to this lodge, and the owner of the lodge had a buddy who had cattle and a different buddy who had wine. Oh, so man. we, I got a picture of us at this giant table, 16 of us, and there was bottles of wine and the, this oh, awesome man. meat, and it was just an amazing, amazing week, wow. long week. That was so cool. So you got so to yeah. do that bucket and check that off check the bucket, that bucket list. list. What's the third one that you want to the do? The third one is I want to go to Alaska, and oh. I want to shoot sea ducks. I want to go uh, eider, um, Harlequin ducks, I think that's a little more uh, mountainous, but coast. Um, uh, old squaw, which are now called long-tailed ducks. Wow. So it's a very specific group of sea ducks that obviously, you know, we obviously don't have them here. Right. So that's going to be my third thing. So it's funny, my, my wife laughs at me at the time. You went to, you went to the, you the three bucket list. You did the two farthest ones and not the closest one, right? You went to Canada <laughs> and Argentina, yeah. but not right there. That's good to, to check, check those off first. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, yeah. And so I want to do that. Uh, a, a client who became a friend uh, he's gone a couple of times and got the Harlequin ducks, and he knows the whole deal. So oh, it's cool. right around a Thanksgiving time hunt before it gets super, super cold. So uh, we talked about it, and we didn't set a date yet, this Thanksgiving or next, but we're going to do that. A group of us are going to go do that, and I'm going to get that third. I'm going to check that yeah. box. You need to f- look into, and I don't know if you know about this, just like I mentioned my travels in Spain, I, I had this idea, like I want to do this bucket list hunt in Spain, because they're big in duck hunting, too, oh, in the Valencia yeah. region. Okay, I don't know right. if I've told you about that. A little. Do you know little. anything about that? Not much at all. Okay. Not much. Yeah, I need, I, I've been trying to do research, but, like, Googling it, and I'm only finding, like, these guides. Like, I, But I, I don't know if it's, like, the, 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 the type of hunting that I've been reading about in Valencia. Right. So, they, so to give people an idea of, of Valencia, it's in the northeast region of Spain, and it's – there's some parts of it that are marshy, but it's, it's it's where they grow the rice. Okay. So that's like rice country. Sure. For the paella. And and, and these are kind of like flooded fields, I absolutely. guess. Absolutely. And I, I think the area where these ducks really congregate, it's called the Buffon, I think. I might be getting it wrong. Okay. But they have like these situations, I guess they're like hunting clubs that maybe have leased this land. Makes so sense. So you got to like be a part of that maybe. Right. I don't think you can get a guide, but their setup's kind of interesting. They, like they're in the middle of this marsh. And it's in a blind, but I don't know if it's like a pit also. So I don't know if they, they dug a hole that, and they just kind of wait, you know, same, same kind of situation. And they just, you know, shoot the, the ducks at daybreak. That, but I find it kind of weird. Like, just, I don't know. That some that pretty much all tracks and makes sense in in uh, Lake Charles area and in, in Gaydon and all that west of Lafayette. Okay. You can hunt flooded rice fields and they are pit blinds. They dig oh. and they have a, they sink a, a box into the ground. And then, of course, you have your shooting window, but it's it's for, for camouflage purposes. But yeah, absolutely, that all makes sense. Yeah. What you said, they do that. You a should lot. look and, into that. Yeah, I'm gonna check it out. Because I think I think it's like a, a a big thing there. But when I was when I was younger, my idea was I'm gonna go all over the globe and shoot, oh, shoot nice. geese. And then I narrowed it down to the three bucket list items. But yeah, so I yeah. knew they were because it can get expensive. All, oh yeah, big time. Yeah. Need a little cash for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's a weird right. thing of like. Man, duck hunting is really like a rich man's sport. Sadly, like I yeah. guess you can make it. Here's the thing, though. It. it any any hobby you can you can blow it out yeah. right. I have some friends who bass fish and they have crazy expensive bass boats and two hundred dollar reels and I mean you you can yeah. take anything to the edge. But yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah, that's right. But you know golf but like club, deer hunting uh, golf clubs. Well, deer. Well, you got like your, that could be cheap. Yeah, that that could be. And like you if, could have if your you're getting, rifle yeah. in the public some public land. Yeah, you could. I, I'll. I think yeah, dollar for dollar that. deer hunting is a little more efficient. Yeah, cause, yeah, yeah. You, you get still, a lot more meat. Yeah, right, yeah. right. Yeah. But yeah, that, I mean, yeah. But I guess if you do the guide route, 
You don't that, have to spend a lot. Now that way you could do it. You Correct. Know? Yeah. yeah. No yeah. doubt. Going back to the boats uh, okay. before uh, we finish it up. Sure, sure. Explain like the boat situation with, with marsh hunting. Okay, so you have the latest craze for the past, I don't know, I'm going to get this wrong, six, eight, and maybe more than that, 10 years, let's say, let's call it 10 years, surface drives. Two guys from, it was USL when I was there and when they were there, it's UL Lafayette now. Their senior engineering project was they wanted to they put a lawnmower engine on the on the shaft and propeller of an outboard engine. Okay. Because they wanted air cooled because they wanted to go into the mud. Like deep in, yeah. Deep into the mud. With an outboard engine, it sucks water to cool off. Oh. So the water gets sucked in the mud, and if you go in a shallow, alarm goes off. You got to clean it out. It doesn't work. But they said, well, if we put take a a, a, a um, lawnmower engine, which is air cooled, we don't need. It could go in. Is straight muck. If we can make the hmm. boat move, it doesn't matter. It doesn't. There's no water to cool off the engine. It, it doesn't work that way. So they came up with this. And the two main main surface drives are Gator Tail and Pro Drive. So pretty much everybody you see either has one of those two. There's some uh, uh, mud motors, the different mud motors. They call it mud motors. Mud yeah. motors or surface drives. Okay. Um, uh, Go Devil was a really big popular when I was younger. It had a long long tail. It was a whole di- a little different setup, but. And then, uh, so there's uh, Go Devil, but the main ones, like we said, are Pro Drive and Gator yeah. Tail. So what you can do, so you take a, our lease, fortunate enough, is close enough, we can just go with our surface drives from the landing to the lease, and then from the, into the camp, yeah. and then from the lease into the marsh to the blind. So we can, we can do it all in one boat. But a lot of people either leave their Gator Tails or Pro Drives at the lease, Kind of hidden, okay. but then they take a, an outboard motor from the landing because they got to go a, long, a longer distance to get to their camp. So a lot of people have the outboards, and then they get into the surface drives. We're lucky enough to be able to do this the whole route with the oh. surface drive. But it's a and it changed the game for it, it hunters in South Louisiana. Did. It huh? totally, totally did because you could get to places you just flat out couldn't get. I mean, unless you were you know 18 years old and buffed up and you wanted to paddle or or literally push pull, not paddle to some you know way deep into the marsh that you weren't going to get to, you know, you'd you'd push pull for an hour to get there. Now you can just get in your surface drive and it's four inches of water and you can get there, you know, or less. So it, it really did change the game. So yeah, it, it, it made a lot of stuff different. Definitely did. Good and bad. It sped up, it sped up, you know, you, you can get to a lot more places, but now you got that many more hunters too, because they get to that many more places. Yeah. So yeah, so there's there's pros and cons. And pros of, and cons of right, this technology, right. and, and that yeah. And then it's funny too because you and I have gator tails, mm-hmm. and we obviously. And then some some people even even within a camp, it's like Ford and Chevy or, or oh, you yeah. know that type of thing. Yeah. You got a pro drive. Oh, you got a gator tail. Oh, yeah. mine's better. Oh, mine's better. So yeah, that, the that ribbing. Kind of that goes oh, the ribbing. Yeah. That's all part of the yeah. camp life. So in our camp, we have gator tails and pro drives. Probably okay. I didn't never count three and three. I guess probably three of each. Yeah. And then one guy had a Copperhead, which was an off-brand, but he... Oh, I don't think I've heard that. Copperhead, yeah, surface drive. Small, okay. little, it's not nearly as popular. We ended up not liking it, and so he now has a pro drive. Okay. So, yeah, that's funny. So Yeah, it's, it's a, definitely a different kind of duck hunting. It's a, and I guess that's why people like maybe the rice, if they had to choose. Yeah. Or the field hunting, it's a the lot The field easier. hunting, you can, you can basically... What, what happens with the field hunting is you can get to a lodge by, uh, by car, Okay. But you don't have to have the whole setup, the camp, the lease, et cetera. So if you have a, if you have a, a rice field or a lodge or a guide that has the r- rice field, you can drive there, and then they take you out in the Polaris or the 4x4 four because four it's hard land. Okay. And then they can take you along the, the, the rice pond edge, and then you get into the pit blind. It's like a little levee. Yeah, a little sorts. levee. Yeah. That's correct. Yep. Right. And then you get into the pit blind, and you hunt, and then they take you back. Yeah. As opposed to where we're at, it's a it's, it's a, a it's a commitment. It's a work. Yeah. you you got to have boats, surface drives. You know the lease. The you don't have to have the camp, but the camp, you know, it's a lot of work. It's it's a whole different uh, animal. Yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, but I mean, I got hooked when it was. When, yeah, it was awesome, and I'm glad yeah. you said that because it, it just jogged another thought. And I was gonna say it earlier. It's so awesome for me hunting. So I'm 54. I'll be, I'll be 54. Mm-hmm. So I've hunted my whole life pretty much. But it's awesome to go through the phases, and this kind of ties everything together. When I was young, I wanted to shoot. Every duck I could get my hands on, I wanted to shoot yeah. my dad's limit, my limit. You can't deal with that. But anyway, that, w- that was my kind of deal. And then you go to, oh, man, I'm going to get a dog. 
and then you experience that, and you hunt with the dog. And I got as much enjoyment out of my dog's Roxy and your yeah. Goso. Goso, yeah. I got as much. Hunter was my dog before that, and then Chip even before that. So I had the three different labs, chocolate, uh, black, chocolate, and then yellow. Okay. But anyway, so you go through the phase of wanting to hunt with your dog and getting right. the getting the kudos and the pats on the back because your dog is so good. As if I did they're anything. So, they're so, I learned <laughs> they're they're so valuable. They're so amazing. They, I love that. I hate the waste, and man, I would send Roxy after ducks rock that I had. The rock star, yeah. my buddy Tony calls her rock yeah. star. Man, I would send her after ducks I had no business sending to, just because I don't want that duck to just die and be yeah. waste. And man, she, her nose. Uh, all dogs are awesome, but I like to. I didn't have anything to do with. It. I'm not bragging because I didn't have much anything to do with it. A yeah. little bit, but she's awesome, rock star. And man, she would just come back with these birds, find them with her nose, and come back with them. And everybody hoots and hollers because yeah, yeah. it's just so awesome. So you go through that phase of working your dog, and then Roxy, I have on hand signals. I can guide her, you know, almost like a little remote control. I can guide her to an area, and then her nose takes over, and then she gets, you yeah. know, that duck. But then you do that. But then the point of bringing all this up was in a case like you. Of now, of course, I love that still, and I still love shooting. But now it's fun to bring like you, who who hasn't really experienced yeah. it, and to help you learn the birds and all about the shotgun shells and the camp life and identifying birds and giving you tiny little pointers to shoot, you know, okay, you, you missed that one, so get a little bit in front of it. Any little pointers. So that phase now is the cool thing. And then the and then I guess the next phase is kind of like my dad with me. He comes up in the past. Obviously, he did all the work. And now, happily, I'm doing all the work. Yeah, you're paying he, it he forward. Just comes, pay yeah, it forward. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. right. So you go through these phases as a hunter, and it's just amazing to see. And I'm kind of in that where you are bringing you along and helping you. And so you, you said you thanked me, but I – I was actually kind of thanking you because yeah. getting to, get to share all this knowledge and you know spill all these all the gut, all the beans. Yeah, yeah, so it's fun stuff. No, I love I love it, and I, I can see the appeal like the romantic aspects of duck hunting. At least because, that kind of duck hunting, you know. Because, and and again, that that plays into to it too. Of course, you want to shoot, but it's just so peaceful and serene, and the in the beauty mm -hmm. and. Of course, you want to shoot ducks, but just to see that you know, either even the nature, shore, nature just, oh, and man. shorebirds flying, and yeah. you know, neutral, which is a little marsh kind of animal, mm -hmm. and the the different birds and different sounds. We even have bald eagles all over the around, so you can see a you know majestic bald eagle fly by. Yeah, I mean, it's just amazing the sounds. We we talk you end up talking and you just learn so much about somebody too but they even in the quiet times you just hear nature and it's just, yeah. just amazing it just it it gets me man it's awesome and for me you can smoke a cigar and you can smoke yeah, a cigar yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah that's obvious yeah. right we with us with this the, conversation the only problem with that's what i like about deer hunting is because you have to account for the scent the control scent. so Absolutely. i hate that i can't smoke a cigar on the way to the lease right because that'll scare off the deer, I guess. Correct, correct. But duck hunting, that's not even a concern. No, like not they, even. They can't no. smell. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. And then... and then. What about the smoke? Does that maybe flare them away or scare them away? I've never heard that. And we've yeah. been pretty successful smoking right. cigars, so right. I'm going to say no. Yeah. We'll go with that. Because I'll see setups of people like on social media where they're even cooking yeah. like on the boat. They like, have a little like yeah. propane tank. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of like the flooded timber we talked about in Arkansas where the, the, the mallards and stuff are coming over the treetops and then they're dropping in, they're kind of dropping into oh. a into a pond, a cleared out area. So the point of that is they make like two and three story duck blinds. So the top story is the duck blind and then down below they there's a little kitchen and you can cook and hang out. If you're not hunting, then you go back down and you oh, cook man. and eat and smoke a cigar or you go back up and you can look out and wait for them to come. So yeah. the, they don't have any of that in in Louisiana because you you can't go down you yeah. can't go down it's marshy mud you'd, yeah. you'd be up you know underwater but and uh, you're talking about hard bottoms of of like Argentina versus what we have in the marsh it's like soft correct huh? it's soft so I'm, that feel, like, I, I'm very scared of that like I don't want to step yeah. off into the boat like you can sink and and maybe even perish and get huh? stuck yeah yeah correct like it's so soft like it's it, really it, muddy. it is it's it's basically floating chunks of land and water mixture you know and then water under it. And it's not quite hard enough to walk, yeah. but just hard enough where you can't swim through it. It's kind of that murky, jello-y type yeah. pudding type. Um, but then, obviously, well below there's hard land. But you know, it you don't want to you don't want to get any part of that. Yeah. You don't want any part of that. Yeah. It I say it's funny. That's the wrong word. But I'm just so used to hunting. I took my uh, stepbrother many, 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 many years ago. Big, bigger guy. And this was a different lease than the one I took you, one I took you to. Okay. We, we pulled up we pulled up in the boat, and, and this was well before surface drive. So we pulled up into the bank, and then 
I've walked that marsh my whole life. I, I know what to do, and just like anything, you just kind of learn it. So I didn't even think to tell him. So I get out, and I just walk, boop, 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 boop. So he takes one step, oh, and he no. goes neck deep. And so oh, <laughs> and no. it was cold because this is the winter. Yeah. I'm like, I, I, I wanted to just punch myself. I was like, God, I didn't even tell him. He's like, man, you just, way after the fact, when he stopped being mad and cold, yeah. he's like, man, you just walked like it was cement. And I was like, yeah, that was totally my fault. I yeah. just did not tell you that. Oh, no. I should have done that. So anyway, that, that morning, we immediately got back and went back to the camp, and he dried off and got all that. And yeah. and, and then we went back, and I, I showed him, okay, let's, here's where we're going to walk and do this and do that. You can kind of step at the at the base of a plant, and it's the root system, and you can kind of at least get a little bit of leverage. And so you can kind of feel your way and you walk. Um, but I had completely forgotten to tell oh, him no. that. He, he was not happy. Not a happy camper. Yeah. He did come back, though, a different weekend. So he, many times. So it was, it didn't turn him off, but I should have thought that through. Man, that's funny. Yeah. Um, so I was reading, I, I saw, I read this article yesterday, go, actually. Yeah, and I'm, re- yeah, yeah, you got to read light. That's all right. You that's and that, I, man, I'll, I'll that, talk. This, yeah. is, this is our thing. Yeah. <laughs> so I read an article yesterday that talked about the explosion of the alligator population i don't know if you saw that i think it was in the the daily advertiser i forget what newspaper or online site and there was a state rep in louisiana that brought up this proposal to increase the amount of alligator hunting like that's causing a lot of damage huh what's your experience with that it is And and, and i'm bringing this up because the article mentioned a lot of duck hunters are afraid to bring their dogs out that, for fear of the alligators eating them. That is absolutely correct. I haven't, I didn't see the article you're talking about, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Roxy, and of course your dog mm-hmm. Gozo. I, I try not to even take Roxy till the second or third split, just so this, the illusion of cold, right? That the alligators are are there. Yeah. And if they're active, and you send your dog out to get a duck, right. and the alligator's active. I mean, it, it's a scary, scary thought. So the whole first split, when it's hot, still, yeah. I, I don't even take Roxy. And she sees me getting that camo in the gun. She's like, dude, are you seriously leaving without <laughs> yeah. me? But, she but gets mad. She yeah. gets mad. But, uh, but yeah, it's a concern. I know of... I know of two people who have had that happen, and oh, it's uh, it's just heartbreaking. It is oh just so... And the dog gets excited, and... Oh. and, and, and he saw this one guy saw and it was coming and he saw it in his marsh. You can't just run over there and right. Yeah. It, it, oh. Yeah. So that's want, why. I yeah. Talk, I don't. I yeah. want to talk about that. Well, no. But, but, yeah. But, but but it is a concern because lots and lots of people have dogs to take hunting, but then it's like, man, I don't yeah, know you're putting I, that dog I, at I, risk. You're absolutely. Yeah. So you got to leave a, leave the dog at home. And then, yeah, it, yeah, absolutely. And then, like I said, I try and go in January, take her in January when it's cold, it's and hopefully they're away. Um, because, yeah, they become inactive the colder it gets. Correct. correct? And then they kind of hibernate and, and stay still. And, and even, I don't want to say you can go touch them, but you can get a little a little closer to them and they don't even move. They just want to not move. So you kind of you kind of can avoid them yeah. somewhat. Have you ever hunted alligator? I have not. Yeah. I have a different friend who, who did it for a while, and he said it was just amazing. And this was before Swamp People and all that was yeah, happening. Yeah. And so he, he would do it. Um, I put in my tag by the way this year. Oh, did you? Yeah. So all hopefully right. the lottery. Okay. Yeah. All right. I win if, if I do it. If we'll you get with him get and we'll get it all figured oh, out. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We'll yeah, definitely yeah. get with him and he'll give us all the yeah, scoop on it. Yeah. Right. Huh? Fingers it, yeah. crossed. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, I've never done it, but I know I know what you do and how to do it. Yeah. And I've seen people do it. Several of my friends do it, but I, I haven't done it. And that's good meat. Yeah, that's good that. stuff. Yeah. Tastes the like tail. chicken. Oh, it tastes like chicken. Yeah, right. yeah. That's right. Yeah. Tastes like chicken. Yeah. I like it. It tastes like chicken, right? Yeah. Just go with it. Yeah. Yeah. It's good stuff. Yeah. But yeah, I, th- I hope that the state addresses the situation. Like the population. So the article I remember it said in 1950, the alligator, the alligator population in Louisiana was about 100,000. Okay. And now it's over 3 million. Jeez. I. One million of which is farmed, two okay. million which is wild. Okay. And it's just, it's going out of control. Like, and and I can, and, and I think the state and I'm sure most people would agree with this that that are in that world yeah they need to increase the amount of tags or issuance to you know, right. control that population hundred percent and I can totally agree because a whole subject we have to save for the next if I get to do a podcast to crawfishing I know and I so, wanted to touch oh, on okay, that yeah we won't I, I know, yeah. yeah yeah we'll get to that we have time, but, but, but the point of sure. that is between hunting and then crawfishing which is now that I, I'm almost finished now did you have a good spring, season uh, really good season okay. yeah yeah well, yeah again we'll cut yeah on, on a future visit yeah we'll but talk to about but not it. to sidetrack us i see alligators almost every time i go 
run my traps, run mm. my crawfish traps. So I, c- I can see how, yeah, the population, even in my little area, is just exploded. Yeah. I-, I totally can see that article being valid. Yeah, valid. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll try to find the link. I-, I was trying to load it up, but it wasn't working. But yeah, apparently we have more alligator than Florida now. Oh, geez, yeah. And you know, oh. alligator alley in Florida, they have the problems there. Yeah. But yeah, they just need to do something about this. So a, a quick little side note, but still alligators. Between Morgan City and Baton Rouge, mm-hmm. I go through Pierre Port and some small, small little towns. Not that Morgan City is a metropolis, but some even smaller towns. And now that you mention it, I want to say I saw three yep. dead alligators on the side of the road. The road Just, kill. just yep. this morning, the road kill. Oh, even when I go from Baton Rouge to New Orleans yeah, on the yeah. interstate, you'll see the dead yeah. carcasses that got hit. Yep. Like, it's just, it's just bad. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, let's uh, we're gonna try try to wind it down. I know we're trying, uh, to, but it's just got, so good engaging talk with you. Yeah. Um, let's get back to the cigar. What what, okay. what are your thoughts on it? I like it. It's just what you said. I, without you telling me in the when we first smoked them in the duck blind, light and creamy. Mm-hmm. Very. Uh, we only had to relight them just because well, of our just because of our talking. It. You, yeah. you got to relight yeah. it. Not because the quality of the cigar was fine. It even burned. Yeah. Um, I like the creamy and the light. Uh, as yeah. w- where we kind of started with this with duck hunting. I told you, I was like, man, I, I don't know that I can smoke a cigar at yeah, 6 a.m. Yeah, yeah. early in the morning. And mm-hmm. you said, well, I got just the one, and and this is absolutely it. I've gotten several bundles since that, yeah. and this is just an amazingly light, creamy cigar. I well, really enjoy it. Well, that's what I love about this cigar is that there's no none of that like residual harshness that some cigars leave right, you know, right, in your right. mouth. Or yeah, just, yeah, you, you can just, feel it uh, even days after. This is right. so clean. like. And I like that it's it's smooth and clean. Easy burning, and because when I ball the crawfish, while I'm doing my process, I like to smoke a cigar, and this is a good price point. Yeah, and I get a good long time out of it, right about my time that I need to boil my crawfish. Yeah, so I usually smoke these in the duck blind, and then while I'm boiling crawfish yeah. that I caught that morning. Yeah, but again, we'll talk about that next time. Um, so getting into your cigar habits, do you have okay. a favorite drink that you like to pair with a cigar, alcohol or non, or no drinks? Um, no, not no drinks really. Um, my cousin who I keep talking about, he, he says, so funny, my three best friends, they all smoke cigars and they don't drink. I'm not opposed to it. I just right. kind of never really started. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I just, I just like the cigar itself. Yeah. And I mean, water, like or a purist. water yeah. just a purist, yeah. and, you know, a little water or something like that. But yeah, I just like to get all the flavors of the cigar mm-hmm. I can get out of it. Again, mm-hmm. not that I know all the notes anywhere near like you, but I can, it's like duck hunting. You kind of learn the cigars. I'm kind of yeah. learning. Hey, I like this one. I like, I can taste, I, I can kind of taste this note. I can kind of taste that. And, and I'm, I'm learning and getting through it. So, and I tell clients, look, especially individuals just getting into the cigar scene, you don't have to know everything, Correct. right? Just you don't have to try to come up with these notes or detect them. You either like it or you don't. That's you right. can tell if you like it or not. That's, That's right. it. So, That's and don't right. be intimidated. Just and just try. Like, be willing to try as many different blends as possible. And it, it's going to sound like a shameless plug, but I 100. It's not when I when I would go to New Orleans to work in some ad agencies. I would go to uh, your dad and brother's store, and and they were very helpful. And they said kind of that same thing. Look, don't. The magazines, you know, you can use that as a guide. The cigar magazines yeah, use that yeah. as a guide. But, you know, tell me what you're thinking you want. And, and they kind of guided me to those right cigars. And, awesome. and I just kind of learned from there. And then you kind of branched out and tried this, tried that. And different friends, hey, try this cigar. I like this. I don't like that. And it's funny because everybody's like different people have different cars. You you taste right. something different than I taste. Right. Or, or, so, you know, you just follow these different flavors and you just kind of find what you like and, and what i might like you might not and vice correct. versa and there's nothing wrong correct. with that that's no. why there's such a diversity of flavor profiles correct. and formats correct so cool uh favorite cutter uh, style of cutter like uh, double i like blade? the v cutter man like I, 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 okay. I just go with the v cut i just i just like yeah. it lighting method match S- soft lane yeah, yeah no no um so the majority of time that i smoke is duck hunting or at the duck camp yeah usually it's the winter and colder so i'll go with the torch just for effectiveness yeah yeah but on a spring when i'm like now when i'm cro- boiling my crawfish i like to take the cedar and light the cedar oh, nice. and then do it that way yeah um cedar spill. yeah so i'm not a purist and have to do it either way it's just more convenience and, and yeah. effectiveness is, is my answer yeah. for that one Cool. So it's funny because I got uh, several torch lighters from you from duck hunting in the afternoons, the few times I did afternoon duck hunting. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, man, I need a, I need this thing to light, dude. I need some yeah, yeah. To fight the you wind. Need something and, reliable, and I, yeah. need, I need to get it. It needs to light yep. this cigar because what happens, so I bought a big uh, cigar ashtray 
and I put it on the top of my center console of my gator tail so that I can smoke. And if I see a duck coming, I can throw it into that big tray oh, nice. and then shoot and then pick it up. And I got to relight it yeah, again, yeah. of course, right. or sometimes. So anyway, I needed that, that, that triple jet or the four jet flame mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. really cut through that wind and, and, and light my cigar quickly. Again. Yeah. And then hurry up and throw it back down because another duck's coming. <laughs> exactly. Got to get ready. Right. All right. On to our final segment. We're trying to do something consistent here. Okay. We're calling it the final puff. All right. Three rapid fire question rounds. Ooh. You don't have to explain. Just to get the answer, and we'll go on to the next one. Okay. Tabasco or crystal? Tabasco. Favorite vacation destination? Casa de Campo in the Dominican Republic. Okay. The ideal person you would like to smoke a cigar with, whether he's alive or deceased? This is going to sound corny, but my dad and my cousin, who I keep mentioning, uh, two big influences in my life, and I get to do that with both of them. In fact, later this month, I'm going to see my cousin for a long weekend, and, and that's on the on the schedule, nice. some cigar smoking at his ranch. Nice. Yeah. Well, that does it. Um, Do you have any parting words before we wrap it up? No, man. Come to Havana Port. It's, yeah. the, it's the spot in New oh. Orleans or Baton Rouge. Shameless plug. Thank you, Yeah, I appreciate yeah, it. I'll no, take it. It's yeah. just good, though. It is. It oh. is. Like I was saying with, with your dad and, and you guys, I mean, y'all take the time to explain if you want to explain or left alone. I know what I'm getting. I want this, this, and this, and you can get us that. So I, I love the amount of interaction, you know, for newbies all the way to established smokers. Yeah. So. Well, we appreciate you coming on today and Happy sharing to do your it, insights of duck hunting. It's so exciting. <laughs> I love it. That was and, awesome. Uh, we'll have to get you on another episode, we especially because we didn't even touch about your crawfish. Yeah, that, and that's harvest. a whole yeah, yeah. that's a whole hour in itself nice. for sure. That's big fun too. Well, so. thanks again. I appreciate awesome, it, buddy. Man. Happy to All be right. here. Happy Say hi to, to the wife too. I will definitely do that. All no right. doubt. Thanks Thank again, you, sir. Appreciate All right. it. Take care. All right. Thank you for tuning in today. We hope you found today's conversation insightful and entertaining. If you enjoyed this episode and want to discover more episodes. Check us out at thelifepro.com or any other major streaming platform. If you're interested about the cigars we smoked, you can visit us at shop.habanaport.com. Until the next cigar, thank you.